No, then let's go on to Thomas Hobbes. And I do something uh, what probably not everybody does uh, in a, a kind of history of ideas course. Uh, I give you um, uh, an overview of the individual uh, whom you were reading uh, from. Um, and uh, 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 around uh, some sense of the historic times they lived in. Occasionally I get negative comments in my course evaluations for this. People want just to talk about the text, what they have to know. Um, uh, there are some people who like it to see, well, this is how Thomas Hobbes looked like. Uh, the character was. So, therefore, I feel the duty. I think what I will try to do is uh, to go very fast through the sort of individual's life and history, sort of to have my cake and eat it, right? Uh, to give those of you who are interested in the historical context, um, at least briefly, and those who are not particularly interested, not to bore them with it, but you can go back to the internet and get into more detail. Okay, so we start uh, this with uh, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, 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 whether foundations of modern social thought should start with Hobbes or not, that's a question. Uh, in some other courses, I thought, occasionally I suffer with Thomas Taken, I will talk about him um, uh, very briefly and, uh, uh, later on. But in some ways, arguably, Thomas Hobbes is the first uh, who laid the foundations of modern social science. Um, uh, he was a genuine scientist uh, and a formidable one, and an extremely controversial figure, addressing a number of very important issues. We are all still very divided, particularly of human, human nature. Um, are we by nature good, or are we by nature evil? Uh, I think probably half of the uh, crowd here, I would go one day, the other half, you know, another day, and I hope we will discuss that in the discussion section. Anyway, there are a number of very important issues for Thomas Hobbes' brain, and which has a great deal of impact on later social scientists, of course, on law, but also on Adam Smith, on Nietzsche, on Freud, uh, on uh, um, uh, uh, Max Weber, and others. Okay, so this is Thomas Hobbes, and uh, let me just very briefly talk about his life. I mentioned that in the introduction of the lecture, he was born in 1888. In that course, I also mentioned that his father was a vicar, and he had actually a big fight with a clergyman of, in all places in a cemetery, which was absolutely no no by that time. So he had to skip and disappear and leave a young Thomas behind in the care uh, of an uncle who was actually a glover <coughs> of his gloves uh, and, uh, and it all happened under the rule of Queen Elizabeth I will talk about in the revolution and uh, in 1602 uh, he went to Oxford to Magdalene Hall and then in uh, uh, Kuwait uh, he graduated and he became a tutor of William Kevin which is the second uh, he became at the front point a very important uh, politician. Uh, in uh, 1610, he went to France and Italy. It was very important because he met, met Galileo and he was absolutely turned on by Galileo and the uh, critics of his time. Uh, I already mentioned that the top cannot be classified in any of the disciplines. He even cannot be classified as a social scientist. He was as much a mathematician, I guess a pretty bad mathematician, uh, but also he made this important contribution to scientists, particularly to optics. Well, uh, uh, he has close association uh, with a person whom you may have, have heard of, uh, Francis Bacon, and who was Francis Bacon, and what he was his uh, influence. Uh, uh, Francis Bacon, uh, for the philosopher uh, who rejected uh, the Aristotelian logic and system, 
and uh, which basically was a speculative question, uh, started out from some major assumptions uh, and through deduction developed this philosophical system. Uh, as I said, occasionally I, I told this course by talking with uh, Francis Bacon, that Bacon in some ways is the founding father of modern uh, sciences, because he said every scientific investigation should start with induction from sensual <coughs> observation, and what you cannot observe, you should not assume it does exist. Right? Therefore, he advocated a, a methodology which was exactly the opposite of the Aristotelian methodology, which was deductive. He uh, advocated induction. And now, uh, uh, he was very closely affiliated with Cavendish and had a great deal of impact on Hobbes uh, initially, to eventually Hobbes had changed actually uh, his mind. And he, uh, he went to Europe and, and uh, among others, he spent time, he, he knew that he spent time, he went to Paris and, 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 and uh, 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 he began to investigate natural science. Uh, uh, Galileo and Descartes, uh, and in particular, Descartes was a great deal of importance for, for Hobbes. From Galileo, he learned an alternative to Bacon's inductive method. Uh, um, Galileo offered a methodology of, by and large, social scientists today who believe in normal social science subscribe to. Namely, that was the methodology what uh, Galileo called a resolutive compositive method. It basically meant that you start with deduction, right? You have some initial hypothesis, then you move to observation, sensual observation, and from the sensual observation you make inductions that you make back and you test your hypothesis. That's how he would say it today. And this is what Bacon learned from Galileo and uh, adapted this methodology. Uh, now this is uh, René Descartes, uh, you know, one of the greatest philosophers of his time and of all times. Uh, uh, Descartes uh, ascribed to something I like call dualism, right? Uh, the, the dualism uh, 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 really meant that he separated the soul and body uh, from each other, and Hobbes rejected uh, this idea uh, of uh, 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 dualism uh, because he suggested uh, that in fact uh, uh, they were engaged in a big debate on optics, what, what we do see. And he, Hobbes was advocating that there must be a real object whose movement uh, we see uh, what we actually can see. So he rejected uh, the dualism. And then he wrote, I mentioned very briefly, his trilogy, the corpe, um, this is about the human body, the homine, about man, and finally the sive, about uh, society. I see this is formidable and something which appears a great deal to social scientists today, right? To try to develop a theory of social uh, so, uh, society which begins actually with biology, with biological processes, and build it up gradually from biology to understanding of the social, the individual, and from the individual to understand society. That's highly controversial. There are many social scientists who reject it, but today there are many social scientists who are greatly attracted to this, and we see an, a, a re-emergence today um, of uh, scientists and social scientists. Well, uh, Hobbes entered politics uh, um, as a royalist um, uh, uh, when uh, uh, William Cavendish uh, entered politics. And in fact, Hobbes uh, translated, I also mentioned, to Kiddides, uh, basically because to Kiddides expressed some skepticism about the democracy in, in Athens. And he was greatly skeptical about uh, uh, democracy. Um, and uh, uh, believed uh, the need for a strong uh, central authority. Well, these were very troubled times, uh, uh, troubled times and religious conflicts. 
I skip this one because I know I'm, you are all very familiar with British history, but it all started with Henry VIII, who had a very troubled marital relationship, right? He had three wives, uh, divorced one, executed the second one, uh, in search for a son uh, from one of, uh, one of his, uh, um, uh, his wives. Uh, um, but in the process of uh, divorcing, he split from the Roman Catholic Church, and that's when Church of England uh, uh, emerged, and that's how um, uh, uh, England became a uh, Protestant of its a sort. Uh, uh, um, well, uh, again, as I said, I, I skip this one and go on. Well, this is uh, uh, the eldest daughter um, of um, uh, Henry VIII, uh, Mary I, called the Bloody Mary. Uh, she inherited the throne. Uh, she was trying uh, to uh, uh, um, establish uh, um, uh, uh, Roman Catholicism, but uh, had to resign. There was too much resistance. Uh, against it, uh, so he had to resign and uh, uh, give the throne uh, to uh, his younger sister, um, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, and this is Queen Elizabeth. Um, and Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, was at the time of uh, Puritanism under a great deal of pressure of Puritans who wanted to get rid of Catholics altogether. Uh, from government in England became this became a very important issue uh, later on. Uh, New Haven has its Puritan connections. Uh, uh, anybody is from Davenport College? Nobody is from Davenport. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, so no real Puritans around here. Well, that's a shame. Anyway, this was uh, Reverend John Davenport. Um, he was a Puritan who settled. Um, in uh, uh, New Haven with his followers in 1638 and uh, uh, already, of course, in, I think, 1703, uh, the Puritans created this institution and they were basically running this institution until the late 19th century. Not anymore. Okay. Uh, uh, now, uh, there were a great deal of conflicts between, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the, uh, Mary was called the Virgin Queen. Well, uh, whether she was virgin or not, it's unclear, but she clearly had a lot of uh, uh, very close friendship uh, with various men in her life, but she never married and never gave um, uh, birth uh, uh, to a child. She was actually a very good queen, uh, a smart, good, 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 good queen. Uh, uh, by, uh, you know, the challenges of the time. Uh, 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 but uh, she was the last one and, and died without a, a son. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, the, uh, the crown went over uh, to, the, to the stewards uh, and they were total disaster. James I was already a disaster and Charles I was real disaster. And they were in collision course with Parliament, and there was a constant war uh, in England, civil war, uh, culminating in 42, and finally Charles I was executed in 49. Um, uh, and uh, Oliver Cromwell came to power. Now, um, well, here I give you a, a picture of the execution of Charles I. If you don't believe it, you can see it. Uh, well, Hobbes got into, into some trouble at that time uh, 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 because he was too close to the royalists and he had to flee England uh, in 1640 uh, uh, ahead of time and he went uh, uh, to uh, live in, in Paris. Um, he was very close there to the royalist exiles and in 51 uh, he completed his major book Leviathan, what we will be talking about in a minute. Uh, um, well, Leviathan became an extremely controversial book. It was very controversial in his times. It uh, became uh, uh, actually a, a big hot topic in the 19th century. And it's a very hot topic in the last 30 or 40 years because a lot of economists and political scientists who are interested in rational choice theories discovered in Thomas Hobbes, the first rational cho choice theorist. It's actually, he's a wonderfully lucid mind, and if you read the text and you know enough mathematics, 
you could do a lot of his propositions in mathematical equations. What on earth an economist wants to do, right? It must be true if you can put it into an equation, right? Well, that's what certainly Thomas Hobbes is available to do because of the extremely lucidity uh, of, 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 of his mind. Well, it was uh, therefore a controversial book also for the royalists because in 51, uh, Hobbes, and we will talk about this in great detail, was considering that probably people should be allowed to transfer their loyalty to a new authority which offers safety, right? And that's what the royalists did not want to hear, that Cromwell actually can become a legitimate ruler. And that's what, in a way, um, uh, the book uh, um, uh, 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 Leviathan uh, uh, foreshadows. So he better had to skip out of Paris and go back to uh, London. This is the first edition of Leviathan, uh, 51. And this is about the idea that people are by nature evil and we need an all-powerful sovereign to avoid the state of war of uh, uh, everyone against everyone else. Powerful proposition, again, I would think, probably half of the people in this classroom, when really think hard about it, do believe Hobbes' argument. Half of them would be violently opposed to the argument, right? Uh, so it's a very nice topic to have heated discussions in uh, the uh, 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 discussion sections. Leviathan uh, is a sea monster, the state or the sovereign. Uh, we need to keep order as such. Okay. There were a great deal of controversies around him. Um, uh, he actually was publishing rather neutral stuff, only attacking universities, which is always a good thing to do, right? Uh, uh, but then in uh, uh, 1660, the monarchy was restored and Charles II, the son of Charles I, uh, first became king. Hobbes was invited back to the court and it looked like he will be just fine right now as a royalist. Not so, because in 66 there was a fire in London and because of this fire, some people believed that this fire was uh, the revenge of God because of the sinful New York, I know not New York, London, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, they were therefore trying to find the guilty one. And who was there? Of course, Thomas Hobbes with his materialism, right? Uh, no soul. So how is that eternal life possible? This must be an atheist. His book should be burned, if not himself. So they did not burn his book and himself, but, you know, he certainly was uh, out of grace and died in 79. He was greatly admired in continental Europe, but was very controversial in England. And, well, if you don't believe there was a fire in London, here is the proof, right? <laughs> there is the great fire of London, 66, which by, you know, looked like Los Angeles to me, right? Uh, okay, well, it killed 3,000 people, right? Uh, the fire brigade was not as effective as today is in Southern California, okay? Now, that's about uh, uh, the person and the times. I think extremely, for my, as far as I'm concerned, extremely important to understand this, uh, the work, um, if, uh, if you know uh, the times when he, he lived in. All right, so now let me go on and uh, uh, talk to uh, uh, Leviathan. And here we go. Uh, this is the first edition of Leviathan, which came out in uh, 1651 uh, in uh, two big volumes. Each one was 500 pages long. Well, this is the structure of the book. The first part is on man. Uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, the first few chapters uh, are about the mechanisms uh, because of Galileo, Hobbes was obsessed with the idea of motion. Um, so he described the biological emotions what moves man, senses, imagination, speech, reason, and so on and so forth. Uh, then the chapter 6 is a fun chapter. It is about appetites, desires, aversions, and fears, and the theory of voluntary action. I will talk about this. This is really very insightful, very important, a very great deal of impact on contemporary times, and I hope uh, uh, you can also relate to it individually. And then uh, uh, chapter uh, 7 to 11 is uh, uh, the relationship between people um, as such, uh, uh, and then uh, finally the state of nature and the two laws of nature. We will have to talk about this in greater detail. So uh, the uh, part two uh, is about commonwealth. Uh, it's about really uh, the first theory of politics, um, uh, uh, the rights and duties uh, uh, of uh, the government and the subjects. Uh, uh, there are some very interesting arguments here that actually the sovereign uh, also have duties, not only simply rights. And then part three and four uh, offer some theological justification what he does. Uh, uh, this are chapter part three and four are, I think, very rarely read, or at least I see very few citations to it. So what are the major themes of the book? Uh, first about uh, the theory of human nature. Uh, the second one is the relationship between uh, and, uh, nature and uh, so the, the theory of social contract. Uh, Hobbes uh, is really the first of the contractarians, right, who uh, advocates that what brings society together is a social contract. Uh, if you want to understand society, you have to understand that we have contract with each other. And then finally, the theory of the sovereign, right? Uh, the major desire, the essence of Hobbes' work is to try to find an identifiable sovereign, right? He lived in turbulent times when you did not know who the sovereign is. Is this the king? Is this the landlord? Are these the city burghers? Is this the parliament? Who on earth is the sovereign? He wanted to find one identifiable sovereign we can all agree. This is the proper source of law, right? That's what he was obsessed with. Okay, uh, so let me then move on and about human nature. What are the themes here? Well, uh, one important argument is that man will delib deliberate between appetites and aversions. And as a result, it will act voluntarily. Well, it's a fascinating issue, an issue we cannot get read out of our hair. Uh, um, well, when I was in your age, we always were vehemently debating the question, do we have to, to be free will or we don't have free will, right? Our action is over determined. This is exactly the question. Uh, what uh, uh, Hobbes is talking about, and develops the idea of voluntary action, which is kind of halfway between absolute free will and complete determination, right? The idea is that we are driven by appetite, by desires. We will talk in this course later on about Sigmund Freud, right? Who was talking about drives, right? There are drives. Uh, which makes us move. These are what uh, Hobbes called appetite a few centuries before Sigmund Freud. But then he said we also have aversions, we have fears. We are things what we want, but we have fears that we won't be able to achieve what we want. And therefore, uh, we have to somehow negotiate out between our desires, appetites, and our fears or aversions. And what comes out is voluntary action. It's we have a choice, right? We have to measure up what the price of our action will be, and then we decide whether it is worth to pay this price or it is not worth to pay this price. 
Uh, so I see somebody whom I desire a great deal. I thought it would be a great partner for me. But in order to approach that person and to say, can I have a date? It has risks. Because it may say, go to hell, right? <laughs> and I don't want to be rejected, right? I have fears that I will be rejected. So I will be measuring up, right? And some of you, if you are in such a situation, if you sense that the answer will be no, you don't place a phone call, right? And you will never get that person, right? The fear overrules, right? The appetite. Or others will say, heck, you know? If they say no, then I will try a second time, I will try a third time, and if it is no the third time, then I give up, right? Okay, so this is voluntary action, right? This is freedom, right? You are free to decide whether you want to try it again, right? Uh, uh, whether you want to achieve your appetites. And then the second point is, we will seek power. The essence of human nature is that we are striving for power. Again, an issue, very good issue to discuss at the discussion section. Again, I think uh, the half of the class will probably agree with Hobbes that people are actually trying to dominate others. Others will see we are much more benevolent, we are actually nice people, we don't want to dominate. Well, we will see his argument for it. Uh, well, he said actually, it, uh, and the last point is, you know, if we want to survive, we will need an all-powerful sovereign. So, um, Voluntary action, uh, he actually said there are two kinds of motions. One motion is what he calls vital motions, and these are stuff like, you know, uh, food, that we want to have food and something. And that is what he calls, well, it sounds strange today, animal motions. But this is what I think is better called voluntary motions, uh, um, which actually has something to do with um, appetites or desires or aversions and how to deal with this. So let me just speak about uh, appetites and aversions. Again, I don't want to read the text. I will put it on, um, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on the internet for you. Uh, it just describes what I have said, right? That we all have appetites, we have desires, we have needs. And in order to satisfy our needs, it always has costs. And therefore, we have to figure out whether it's worth the cost for us to satisfy that need, right? And therefore, we have a certain degree of freedom. We, don't, we can't do whatever we want to do, right? Because we may not have the resources to afford it, or we, have, we want to have many things, and then we will have to have prioritized what we want to have more and spend more on it. As you can hear, right? Hobbes is very close to what later on becomes the utilitarian, right? Very close to what Adam Smith will argue in his economic theory, or what John Stuart Mill will represent it's, uh, um, in, in, in his uh, utilitarianism. Or for the, at that sake, what, what most economists today believe, right? Who call themselves neoclassical economists, or who identify themselves as rest choice, right, or rational choice, economists or political scientists or sociologists for that sake. There are some sociologists who also subscribe to rational choice. All right, this is also very lovely, deliberation and the will. And he said, well, when we have desires and we have aversions, that's when we actually beginning to figure out, we deliberate what on earth is worse for us. And the end of this deliberation, we have a bill. We decide, I go for it. I want that date, right? Or we decide, I don't want it because the costs are too high. Okay? And this is what we call the bill, right? Your bill will be that I, you decide, I go for it. Or you decide, no, that's not worse for me. It would be silly. I make a, 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 a crowd out of me. I just don't do it, right? That's the bill. Well, a, about power. The power is uh, unending, right? He said there is, right, a general inclination for us to seek power, power influence on other people. 
And he said, this is not, nothing evil about it, it is necessary. Because if we want to survive, we will have to try to exercise influence on others. We have to seek power as such. Extremely important idea which foreshadows uh, especially uh, uh, Nietzsche and Max Weber who comes up later in this course. Well, then he comes a very interesting argument about equality. Very exciting argument. He, he is one of the very first philosophers who claims that we are all born equal. Now for you this is of course obvious but was not obvious in 1651 that people, nobles and serfs, slaves and slaveholders, were all born equal. Uh, and he said, in fact, uh, also extremely important, uh, that they are equal actually in strength because even the weakest, pers weakest person has the capacity to kill the strongest one, right? Even David can kill Goliath, right? But, he said, the same goes intellectually. Uh, in, in fact, intellectually we are even more equal than by physical power. So that sounds wonderful, and you probably all agree with it. But then he makes a very controversial point, and probably there are some people in this room who agree with him, but others probably will disagree with it. Namely, he said, what comes from this equality is this unending fight that because we desire the same thing and he operates with the scarcity assumption that what is desirable is actually scarce we will fight each other, right? And we can fight each other because we are equal because we can kill each other we can outsmart each other uh, this is a very unusual argument, right? He is a very ironic guy, right? Uh, he always says things what you may not want to hear, right? And this is something who believes in equality do not want to hear. That in fact equality can be interpreted as the reason for social conflict rather than the solution for social conflicts. That, that is his argument. Very interesting, very unusual, right? And again, probably the closest to Nietzsche as we will see. Well, then we have, this is, uh, this is, I won't read it, save it, this is the page you want to print, because in, for the rest of your life, if you ever want, right, to cite uh, uh, Hobbes, this is the citation, right? Uh, namely, that we, uh, 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 that if we will be, therefore be, be in a war of everyone against everyone else uh, for the above reasons. Now, about the question of social contract. Uh, well, he operates with this idea of state of nature, and we will talk a lot about this, because in, among the most of the social theories, found, founding uh, fathers of social theories, there is a debate, what is the original nature of humans? And it's controversial whether this is a useful concept at all, the state of nature, but he did believe in this. Well, there are really uh, uh, two basic laws of nature. One law of nature is that you are for forbidden what is harmful to you, right? You have to pursue self-interest. Here again you see the rational choice theory speaking, right? People are self-interested, and this is the law of nature that we should be self-interested, right? We have to do everything in order to preserve our life. But there is a second law of nature, he argues, and this requires that we, uh, yeah, what you would not do, uh, yeah, not to do others what you would not want them to do to you. Right? Uh, this is again, you may want to so save this citation, very important citation. Foreshadows major theories of ethics which come many, many years or decades or centuries after him, particularly Immanuel Kant, right, uh, uh, and his categorical imperativos. Okay. Uh, well, in the state of nature, if uh, there are no restraints, there is no civilization. That's a very interesting idea, right? That pressure limiting the state of nature 
is necessary. This is again foreshadows absolutely Sigmund Freud and his theory of civilization. Right? The civilization comes out of the repression of drives rather than satisfaction of, of drives. If whatever you always need is immediately satisfied, there is no civilization. Civilization comes from sufferings, right? From, from suppressed desires. That's when you go back and you create great pieces of, piece of, of art or you become a great scientist because you suppress your sexual and other desires, right? That's where, you know, it's all that from suffering where great products of humankind are coming from, right? That's what he's saying, and that's, of course, what Sigmund Freud will say. Okay, uh, there are the two laws of nature, and again, I don't want to elaborate on it. This is quite obvious. He said there is the elementary uh, law of nature, the first right, that we have to uh, do whatever is necessary for self-protection, and the other one is uh, that we actually should consider others, what others uh, will do. Well, and then the contract. Uh, well, what follows from the second uh, law of nature uh, is uh, that uh, we put our rights aside and transfer it to uh, others. Well, uh, this transfer of rights uh, uh, is some, there is some reciprocity yet. We give up some rights and we get something in exchange, protection uh, or safety or something uh, as such. Um, and when we transfer this right to somebody else, this is what is called the covenant or social contract. This is, as far as I can tell, this is the first formulation of the theory of social contract. Uh, it's... Uh, not quite the theory of social contract, but we will uh, read uh, from uh, Locke or from Rousseau, because he said to, again, controversial um, uh, uh, comments, one, that in fact a contract we entered by fear is also obligatory. Uh, just because we were forced into a contract out of fear does not, does not mean that we can walk out of this contract whenever we want to, right? So it's a very much status quo. He's a conservative guy. I think it has to be understood, right? He's deeply conservative. And then he also said that, in fact, a former con uh, contract makes void a later contract. So there is no divorce, to put it this way, right? Once you swear, to, you know, that, well, uh, uh, I say with you until we live, uh, that's about it, right? Uh, there is no new contract which avoids it. Well, uh, uh, now uh, very briefly about the power of the sovereign. Its power is uh, to produce safety to the people, right? He lives in unsafe times, so he wants safer safety. But obedience is only due to the extent the sovereign can deliver this safety. And if it cannot like Charles I couldn't, well, you could withdraw your uh, uh, um, uh, uh, obedience, to, uh, your, your loyalty from it. Okay, now, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, important uh, in, uh, uh, he's trying to find out who the sovereign is. And the sovereign actually can be, uh, and uh, uh, I just uh, point out, two words from this citation, can be transferred on one man, right, the king, or upon one assembly of men. That's, I think, extremely important, though he was very strongly in favor of absolutism. He did consider, right, that the sovereign can be a properly assembled body of men. But how they will be properly assembled, he doesn't have the faintest idea or doesn't have the gut to say it, right? It will become much more clearer in Locke and particularly in Rousseau uh, where the sovereign is and it becomes, of course, crystal clear um, in the American Constitution. We start, we, the people, right? That's what the sovereign is. Uh, in Hobbes' time, it was not quite we, the people, but he did consider that it may not be 
the royal, the royalty, the, the king, right? Now the, the sovereign does have duties. Uh, 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 the uh, office of the sovereign uh, has to procure safety of the people. And he said, on, he adds to this, extremely important, that it, it is not bare preservation. It has to give more than just survival uh, uh, as such. And therefore, you can expect to the sovereign to deliver this. And if the sovereign does not deliver, you can withdraw, right, your royalty. So even though he is uh, a theorist of absolutism, he does see, right, the need and possibility that you withdraw your loyalty and you transfer it to a good king, right? To a good sovereign, as such. Um, uh, well, uh, the question is also, what are the good laws? Are, people say good laws are the laws which are good for the sovereign. Uh, and he said that this is extremely important, but I, I highlighted it. It is not so. Not true that good laws serve only the sovereign, the good laws should serve the people. Uh, well, uh, and this is the end of it. What are his contributions and what are his shortcomings? Well, his emphasis is on peace and order, right? But what he does not consider that the sovereign might abuse his power. And this will be the big criticism of Hobbes by later theorists particularly by Locke, we will see it already Wednesday, right? Locke is primarily considered by the possibility that the sovereign may abuse its power. Well, and then he actually does not develop as a result any theory how power can be held in checks. There is no theory of checks and balances. There is one in Hobbes, and even one more developed in Montesquieu, and the American Constitution does not come from Hobbes, but it comes, comes from Locke, and particularly from Montesquieu. Montesquieu is the one which defined that checks and balances which entered the American Constitution. Well, he was an apologetical theorist of an enlightened absolutism, not any absolutism, right? Uh, he was uh, against uh, real monsters, uh, uh, as I already demonstrated it. As a result, he was not acceptable to the monarchs because he put too much limitations on their powers, but he was not acceptable to the emergent bourgeois class because it attributed too much power to the monarchs. And therefore, you know, nobody really liked Hobbes, but though uh, nobody liked, and you may not like him, what is impossible is to ignore him, right? You have to listen to him. Well, see you Wednesday and Thursday in discussion sections.